Hello, welcome to the Project Mini Summit on FinOps. Uh, my name is J.R. Stormont. Uh, I am the president of the FinOps Foundation and uh, I'm joined here today with a really a, a rock star team of folks who have been doing this type of work uh, over the years. Um, I'm gonna start a, a screen share here and hopefully everybody can see uh, my screen. One second here. All right, can I get a thumbs up from the uh, co-presenters if you can see the black screen now? Great. So this screen you're seeing here, this black screen, is actually exactly what we saw on the keynote on the first day of this event, right at the moment when the FinOps Foundation's integration into the Linux Foundation was announced. Uh, Jim, who's the executive director of Linux Foundation, uh, his unfortunately his internet dropped right at the moment of our, our, our big, highly anticipated announcement. So I wanted to go back and bring that slide back. That was one of the things that was meant to be shown uh, as a way of introducing uh, what we're talking about here today in this group. Um, so the FinOps Foundation, uh, which everyone on the call today presenting is, is a member of, uh, just announced that we are merging uh, into become a part of the Linux Foundation. And I'm super excited about this organization for you know what they do around open source, for neutrality, for the building of standards. Um, and a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today is really sort of the, the kernel of what we're gonna be building on over time as a part of this larger organization. So when we talk about FinOps, there's often confusion. Like, what is FinOps? Uh, in fact, anybody who looked in the, the Slack channel will note that there is a FinOS, FinOS, and there is a FinOps with a P, uh, two different projects within the Linux Foundation now. Um, we are FinOps, which is really another term for any of these things on the screen. Cloud financial management, uh, cloud cost management, some people call it cloud economics. These are all synonyms for the same practice. And the practice is one of how do we help get the most value out of every dollar uh, being spent in cloud. You'll note also, if you look at the list of speakers uh, on this call, all of these speakers uh, do FinOps in their organization, but they may not call it that and their titles are all over the place. We've got, you know, uh, Mike is a principal systems engineer, Ashley is a senior FinOps manager, Sasha is head of global cloud operations. This is very similar to the, the mix of things we see uh, in FinOps um, around, which is a really combination of different types of people doing this work. And, and the work and what we're gonna talk about today is, is really this, it's, FinOps is essentially a set of practices. It's best practices, culture, and prescriptive actions that are there really to bring together uh, disparate teams, business teams, finance teams, engineering teams, so that they can work together to get the most value out of their cloud. Uh, it's not about saving money necessarily. Uh, it's about making the right decisions, right? The right business decisions for where to invest more or less. And it can be all the way down to tactical things like we need to right size this thing or we need to buy this reserved instance or committed use discount. And it goes all the way back up to how we structure our chargeback and our investments for where we're gonna uh, spend additional money on infrastructure, all supporting the business decisions and bringing these groups together to collaborate. So the FinOps Foundation, uh, which we're all a part of, is an organization, as I said, now excited to be part of Linux Foundation, that is here to do these three things. Um, first is really to be a central community for this group. Uh, all these people and, and the, the now 1,500 practitioners who are part of the FinOps Foundation have different job titles. They have to work in different teams. It's really hard for them to find each other at an at a Amazon reInvent or a Google Next or any of those things. So we've created a, a set of now virtual events uh, for these people to come together and really to help advance their careers. Um, education is like the core thing in this space because people are not always knowing what it is or they're new to it. You, you typically, you can't go to a, a college and get somebody who's graduated with a FinOps degree yet, right? So we need we need uh, ability to help people up-level their uh, knowledge, their training, their certifications. Uh, and the, the third thing that we are all working on together uh, and now open sourcing via the Linux Foundation is uh, 
best practices and standards, right? So what are the metrics that really matter in this space? Uh, what are the core capabilities that you need to do? You know, how do you structure teams? All of these things are being built out now and, and will be open sourced uh, on GitHub. Uh, need to throw in the, the requisite Dilbert comment, comic. I'll, I'll give you a second to read, read this. This is basically the challenge and the interactions that happen in companies around cloud, right? You've got some business users who don't understand the cloud technology. You've got some finance people who don't understand, you know, the, the cloud as well. You've got the engineers who don't necessarily understand things like op OPEX and CAPEX and their spins impact on the business. And so you end up in this world where there's really ripe uh, for issues of miscommunication, uh, people not knowing sort of what changes to make, who to talk to. And that's really what the FinOps practice is about. It's about bringing together all these disparate groups, right? So engineering and ops teams who are actually deploying infrastructure, uh, business and product owners, who's somebody who's responsible for an application or workload, the executives, right? Who are, are looking to get more input into where technology decisions are made and invested and the finance and procurement teams who are in a completely new world, a crazy new world for them where they historically could report, you know, quarterly and retroactively and now have to keep up with per second level billing from cloud providers and constantly changing forecasts. So the FinOps team is really the group that comes together to help all these individuals work together to make the necessary changes internally with their own processes, but also to interact with the cloud providers uh, as things are being deployed. So today we're going to focus really on that first set um, because it's the open source summit. Uh, I, I don't think there's probably a lot of a lot of finance folks uh, on the call, uh, unless I, I'm incorrect about attendance. Apologies if I am. But we wanted to focus the content today really about engineering and ops uh, in this world of cloud spend. Um, I think the the winning title in my mind uh, was the Live Ramp Team's uh, title, which is uh, bringing cost aware software or doing cost aware software development in the cloud. We want to talk about the pieces as we walk through this agenda of how engineering teams have now started to have to think about money in a way they have in the past and how that affects their behavior. Uh, Mike's going to dig into that and then how to start to tease out metrics that matter to engineering teams. Um, Josh, Sasha, and Patrick are then going to talk about how they structured and built their own practice of FinOps and some of the learnings they had from that. And then we're going to wrap up with Ashley, uh, really showing us what more of like a, a run stage, uh, if, you, if you think about the crawl, walk, run methodology of, of you know, starting simple, advancing, and ultimately getting much more mature in your processes. Uh, Ashley's built an amazing, um, well-documented practice at Pearson uh, with a lot of process built out to ensure that all these different groups can come together, right? To have the right conversations, to have the right data, so they can eliminate confusion and ultimately make better decisions in their cloud spend. So we've got about 90 total minutes. We're about eight minutes in right now. Uh, we're gonna do hopefully most of this content in uh, about 60 minutes and then leave hopefully 25 minutes at the end for both answering your questions and also doing a bit of a panel Q and A discussion. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass over to Mike to give you the story of what engineers face when they start to deploy in cloud. Can't hear Mike yet. Oh, I was reconnected to camera. Is that working now, JL? Yes, can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we did. 
to that. Uh, you've seen the slides. Not seeing the screen share yet. We are seeing it, yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, my name is Mike Fuller. I'm a principal systems engineer at Atlassian. I've been working there for a bit over eight years. Um, about six of those have been focused in the Cloud Center of Excellence at Atlassian, uh, where I, one of the components that we support within Atlassian is the, the FinOps uh, practices within uh, the company. And so today I'm going to talk about a bit of sort of how things change from an engineer's perspective uh, as you move into cloud. And then uh, I guess sort of how FinOps can um, help the engineers as uh, the sort of land changes. Um, and so we, you know, originally I was a platform team uh, member at Atlassian, and, and we hear this story a lot, where, where the, you know, platform team members they, they sort of dream about having servers in the data center, and for those servers to become reality, uh, you know, they have to draw up plans and go to procurement to accounts and and, and sort of pitch for why. Uh, uh, you know, these new servers are going to help the business or whatever. Uh, and if, if that pitching plan goes well, then, you know, we get access to the money and then we can get servers in the data center. Um, and so this is sort of the traditional model. Um, the engineers are requesters, um, but there's this gated um, approval for the actual spend of money in the organization. Um, the spend is fairly predictable. So, you know, besides these large um, purchases uh, outside of that, they're fairly unknown spend um, month to month. <clears throat> they're usually long procurement cycles to get new equipment within the organization. And if, uh, you know, the engineers uh, come up with uh, a bad plan, uh, there's a high cost of failure there. So the... and when we move to... Um, Move to the cloud, we have service teams, um, you know, we move to a DevOps model, we have uh, lots more service teams instead of platform teams. Uh, they're all asking procurement for access to the money. Uh, the reality is they're actually moving to infrastructure as code and automation, um, things like auto scaling. Um, so now we've got the machines needing access to spend money. And so what really happens is kind of uh, the service teams are able to spend money in the cloud uh, without any sort of gated um, process in front of the money. And so then, you know, at first this seems okay, but then eventually these these spends become material to the business. Um, and it's usually at this point we'll hear companies sort of starting to get, um, you know, cloud cost as a pain point uh, and reaching out for, for how do we solve this um, problem. And so when we look at the, the cloud dynamics, um, we've got engineers with sort of a, a free will to spend money with code. Um, finance loses that visibility. And, and as I said, at first, this is not too much of a problem, but uh, it does bubble up to a point where it hits a tipping point. Um, the, the, there's no uh, like large upfront expenses. And now uh, month to month, the spend is very dynamic and, and very uh, hard to predict. Um, and so uh, there's a lot, lot less cost of failure for, for teams to practice, um, you know, to, to try out proof of concepts, etc. Um, but the big thing here is there's a lack of communication now between engineers and finance around spend. And so what we want to do when we move into to FinOps is, is we want to be able to make it so that engineer and, and finance are, are sort of working together, um, that the, the, we don't want to really put in a procurement, um, you know, gate that slows down the organization. We still want to allow that, that fast paced, um, ed, you know, agile experimentation and, and, and allow the auto, you know, infrastructure is coded, et cetera. Um, and allow sort of, um, some predictability to these, um, cloud costs, um, uh, um, as we go month to month. Um, and so when I've done metrics driven cost optimization talks before, I've done a lot of the talks focused on the practitioner. So there's a lot of, um, you know, things that we'd like to to have a single practitioner within the organization manage, things like your, your committed use discounts and your reserved instances. Uh, and there's a lot of metrics that can help the practitioner within the organization to, you know, measure how they're doing on those things and use it to drive the way they, they um, you know, manage those resources. Um, but I wanted to take a step back and, and say, well, you know, how does this look from the engineering team perspective? And, and, and there are metrics that we are uh, available that can help engineers work out how their, their costs are going and, and how efficient they are, et cetera. And so um, we have a pile of uh, FinOps principles within uh, the FinOps Foundation. And, and what I'll try and do is draw, draw the content today towards some of those principles. And so one of them is the accountability is pushed out to the edge. And so 
the idea here is, is when we move to DevOps plus cloud, um, your teams move to a you build it, you run it model. Um, and we just want to add on the end of that, that you optimize it as well. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about optimization from an engineer's perspective, we're really talking about usage optimization. Um, and so if I can um, half the size of an, a server instance, I can half the cost of the server instance. And so if I take a pile of EC2s in this case, um, you know, we've got really sort of a couple of main ways that we can start to, to optimize this usage. There's idle resource removal. And so over time, uh, you know, no matter how, you know, good you are at keeping the house clean. Um, there will be resources that become idle, become forgotten about. Um, and so we wanna be able to identify which resources have been forgotten about and have them cleaned up by engineers. And then the other one is to realize that some of the resources may be oversized. And so, especially when you're doing greenfields deployments or, or new migrations into the cloud, it's very hard uh, initially to predict exactly the size of the servers or, or resources that are needed. Um, and so we can identify some that look like they're grossly oversized and pick them out to resize them down, reducing the cost. Now, of that, that whole pie of recommendations is really divvied out um, to teams around the organization. And this is something that the FinOps practitioner can help with uh, both generating or, or getting the recommendations from, from some uh, other platform, either the cloud provider themselves or an uh, upstream uh, third party vendor. Uh, and getting those recommendations out to the teams that are responsible for these individual resources and asking them to do that investigation. Another principle of the FinOps Foundation is the performance benchmarking is providing our context. And so if we take the, the wastage, um, first we can look at how much um, recommendations, like dollars in, in spend that we have that are on resources that we could probably avoid paying for. Um, and put that in context of how much we are spending on cloud. And that gives us a bit of a, a sort of a feel for how much we, we're wasting. Um, but really, we want to look at what this looks like over time. And so we start to build uh, sort of are we getting better over time with wastage or are we getting worse? Um, and then the wastage itself, um, it, you know, this is made up of all different teams that are responsible for those um, components of, of waste. And so we want to be able to measure the teams across the organization. And so we could do that just in pure dollar sense, uh, how much that they could avoid spending every month if they were to clean up the resources. Um, and so if we did that, um, the, this example, we can see that team A is yeah, definitely got, um, you know, the largest amount of savings that we could generate. And we could say that team A, team A is worse than team C. Um, but we should probably put that in context to how much the, each team is spending on cloud. So, um, you know, if you've got a team that's spending a lot more than others, um, but then having a slightly higher percentage waste, it may not be uh, as in, a good indicator um, compared to others continues to grow or continues to, to sort of do what they're doing on cloud uh, and scaling it up, um, that wastage is hopefully going to reduce. But if it doesn't, that's going to become a problem for the organization. Um, and then it's also important to realize that every recommendation, um, you know, whether it's idle resource or uh, usage of uh, resizing, um, they're not all equal in size. Some things can save us a lot more than others. And so really what we want to do here is work out um, what does this look like when we lay that out on our teams? And so we, we call, uh, you know, every individual recommendation is going to take a certain amount of effort involved to, to look into it and to, to action, to change, um, you know, deployment cycles or whatever. Um, and so this sort of needs to be balanced off to the amount you can save. And so you can see that while team A, you know, originally remember we had $3,000 worth of savings, there's a lot of recommendations for team A to get that $3,000. Um, whereas team B and team C, you know, smaller amount to save, but a lot less effort for them to, to look into the handful of resources. And so we're finding that balance between uh, the sort of effort and, um, you know, potential savings that we could make. Uh, and then real-time visibility drives better decision-making is the, um, I think it's the last uh, principle I'm going to talk about today. There, there are more than these. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we used to call it the, the Prius, Prius effect. Now we call it Tesla effect. Apparently that's way more cooler. Um, so the idea here is, is we have, a, you know, if you think about a 1970s car, um, you know, we fill it up with gas and we drive down the, the freeway. For us to work out how our driving is affecting the efficiency of, of the car, we really have to sort of wait until the, the tank gets empty and then we can, you know, look at how many miles we drove and then sort of back calculate how, uh, you know, efficient our driving was. 
Um, when you move to a, to electric vehicles, um, you know, effectively they give you these beautiful looking dashboards where as soon as you put your foot down on the on the gas pedal um, or electric pedal, I guess, um, you're, you're seeing that immediate feedback um, and, and you can see how your driving is affecting the charge on your battery. Um, and so the, the car doesn't really say drive better, but having that feedback naturally people drive more sensitive. And I guess with an electric car, you're probably worried about making it to the other end of the trip uh, if you're driving really aggressively. And so the idea here is that we translate that to cloud spend uh, by, by presenting the cloud costs um, and making that available to teams as close to the time that they're making um, actions. Um, and so they can connect actions to the, the impact of the cloud bill a lot better than over time. Engineers, you know, traditionally what we've seen with a um, successful FinOps practitioner companies that are doing FinOps, successful FinOps is that they, they become more efficient just by the fact that they're showing engineers the, the, the cost impact of these actions and they become more lean just because they, they're made aware of it. Um, and so, you know, coming back, you know, engineers are really good at generating um, metrics to, to measure the performance of their applications, things like how much memory and CPU or request per second or whatever it is, uh, these dashboards that are really helped them dial in on, on the performance of their application. And so what we're really talking about here is, is this adding an extra metric or cost as a metric um, that they can optimize as well. Um, and that transition us to, to this idea of being able to sort of do a, a business conversation around, um, you know, how good, fast and cheap you want to build your services. And so, um, you know, we want to have it so that your tiers, tier one services or tier zero services in the organization, um, you're probably going to spend a bit more on those to make sure that they are uh, highly available and, and as fast as possible. Um, but we can then look at, you know, maybe those low tier services within the org and you can make those trade offs between how available it is and how, how performant they, they run um, in, in balance with how much they're costing the org. And where we really want to get everyone into is this final, well, currently the, the sort of what we call the final state or the nirvana state of FinOps, which is the unit economics. And so we're going to transition people from thinking about the cost of the service over to the cost of serving their customers or, or, or building some form of business benefit. Um, and so, um, you know, and forecasting costs is really hard. And, and we sort of hear this story as well, where, you know, we get finance saying how much you're going to spend and, and engineers are very hard for them to work out exactly what they're going to spend, especially when you look at longer term forecasts or quarters or years or even three year forecasts. Um, it's almost, you know, uh, shake the magic eight ball. Um, even worse is when you get told by finance that this is how much you're going to spend and, and that's totally not where um, the engineers had, had, you know, had pegged what their spend at and, and they're looking at the, all the projects that they want to get done and, and the spend doesn't fit. And so, um, and, and this usually, these conversations usually come out of, of, of the fact that there's a you know a focus on exactly how much they're spending on cloud, um, and so you know when we look at the forecasting um, and the example I want to sort of draw to, which I have no actual data for, is just a you know, um, you know I'm sure this is kind of how this worked. If we go back to sort of G January uh, this year, I'm sure companies like like Zoom and and Slack would have these nice forecasts what they're going to look like the year is going to look like for their cloud spend, um, and then. Uh, you know, COVID hits, everyone starts working from home, they're signing up way more customers than they ever predicted, um, and their cloud span would have probably been way higher. And so these conversations, you know, without sort of moving on to unit, unit economics, there would have just been conversations about cloud spend is too high and it's above forecast. And so um, if we sort of move that to look at how unit economics allows uh, this conversation, enables the combination conversation better, is yes, cloud costs would have been way up, but the cost per user or the, sorry, the user account that the, these companies would have been serving would have been way higher than they would have forecast. And if they actually combine these two metrics together, you can see that, you know, in, in this sort of example here, that the, the cost of serving each of their customers is actually getting more efficient as they're going up. And so um, it becomes a little bit less about the sort of the total cloud spend, but more in the efficiency or what they're getting out of that cloud spend as, as I say, um, efficiency metric. And so, this is just a quick run through some of the metrics that are available um, to both engineers and, and generated from a FinOps practitioner in the org. With, um, but they're all gold around this idea of um, having the business, the finance team and the engineers team, engineering team sort of put their piece of the puzzle into cloud costs. Um, it's, you know, it's often that the, the engineer will, will be tasked with, you know, a massive migration or net new deployment. 
And they're really focused on sort of the, the technicalities of a migration, et cetera. Uh, but there does become a point where cost is important. And with a FinOps practitioner in, within the org, it's enabling this, um, you know, the three sides to come together nicely without sort of that uh, angst about having to deal with costs. Uh, and so I think that's me and I'll, I'll pass over to the next um, guys at Live Ramp, I think it is. Hello, can you hear me? Well, I think that should work. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, just while uh, Patrick gets our slides up. Um, so my presenta our presentation will be on, um, sorry, I'm waiting for the screen share to close down on Mike's side, I think. Can you see the slides, Josh? Uh, no, but you have to you have to you have to screen share. Sorry, thanks for your patience, everyone. Great. Yes. So our segment is, our segment is going to be about cost software development in the cloud. So I think um, what I'll probably be doing is, uh, along with Sasha and Patrick, is sort of um, going into more of a specific like case study uh, of, of, um, of our experience with uh, FinOps at our company. So uh, the, the way all three of us know each other is through LiveRamp. And um, you know, I served as a DevOps uh, SRE engineer, uh, now, doing it, now doing so as an independent consultant. I'm formerly a sysadmin, uh, and there you can find me on Twitter. Um, Sasha is the head of global cloud operations at LiveRamp. Uh, and Patrick is a senior product manager and in infrastructure also at LiveRAM. Uh, and we've uh, spent a lot of interesting time working together, uh, and you'll get to learn about our experience um, with cloud and LiveRAM and FinOps in just a little bit. Just a quick announcement. Um, so there will be a little bit of an interactive um, segment uh, during this presentation that we're going to try out. Um, everything is new right now, obviously, because of COVID, but um, if you'll humor us and give us give it a try by joining the two-track FinOps channel in OSSELC Slack, uh, you'll be able to do a little bit of participation in our presentation uh, later on. Great. So, so, yeah, just to recap, so, yeah, so we're going to share our experience um, with uh, LiveRamp Cloud and FinOps, talking about our experience and specifically like LiveRamp scale. Uh, Sasha will pose a rhetorical question. Uh, I will talk a little bit about how from the developer's individual perspective, the, I, the IC's perspective, how everything has really changed about, um, you know, building your app, powering your app and operating it and, and, and what responsibilities, uh, you know, you may not know that you have gained uh, in the intervening time, but surprise, uh, you're going to be held to those now. And and then we'll uh, jump into some examples of how, you know, some mistakes we made during LiveRamp's experience and journey to cloud, um, just so you can learn from them. And then a quick wrap up. So uh, this, is, this was our experience at LiveRamp. So the project that Sasha, Patrick, and I all worked on together in our respective roles was to take LiveRamp's data center, uh, which was hosted in San Francisco, and fling the whole thing into GCP within 12 months. Um, this was a coordinated effort over five countries, 40 engineering teams. Um, LiveRamp is uh, in, in, in digital advertising, so there's lots of data to it. Uh, we read and write 13 petabytes of data per day, and uh, we throw it all at Hadoop running on 80,000 CPU cores, a mix of VMware and bare machines, and lots and lots of memory. Um, before in the data center, this was based, uh, you know, it was a chef and VMware sort of build, which, mean, which meant that um, people had to ask for, for server power even uh, and, and provisioning. Uh, we, moved, we moved all of that to Kubernetes. And we also moved to infrastructure as code while doing so. And yes, we did it all in 12 months, and we have many more gray hairs and more stories because of that. Um, so yeah, so sorry. I'd like to hand it to Sasha now just to uh, pose this question. Talk a little bit. Thanks, Josh. 
So, so before I pose this question, a slightly saucy question, um, I wanted to just do a little bit of meta conversation and say um, I, I'm personally very excited that the, the FinOps Foundation has moved to the Open Source Foundation. I, I'm looking forward to contributing in, in, in a meaningful way and sharing and learning from the other members of the group. Um, you're going to hear us talk about um, some of the same things that JR and Mike talk about. And we want to reinforce those topics because we think it's really important for developers to understand this. And the, the three of us, Josh, Patrick, and I, when we talked about building our, our presentation, we, we asked ourselves um, who it was for and who, who could it be most relevant for. And there are specific things I think all developers should understand about both migrations and, and spending in the cloud that will help them succeed. And so um, part of what I'm going to be asking and part of what I'm going to be telling is the insider's perspective from, let's say, the executive um, leading the migration who um, has specific goals in mind that perhaps some developers are aware of and perhaps some are not. But the more that you know about this, the uh, more of a likelihood that you'll be successful in the cloud. So the question I want to ask all of you and it's a rhetorical question again, is, um, is a cloud migration successful if you widely overspend your budget? And I, I think the natural inclination of, of engineers and, and myself included was to say, well, uh, the technical part of it was successful, but then the, the, the budgetary part was not. And I, and I think it makes sense, but at the same time, it's not how the VP of finance thinks. It's not how the CEO thinks of it. And, you know, this in fact happened uh, to LiveRamp. Um, we had this uh, extraordinary migration. We, we pushed 100 petabytes of Hadoop into the cloud within 12 months. It was organized in uh, the most elegant way by Josh and Patrick and all the other development teams that were a part of it. And, and we did it. Um, and, and we felt fantastic about it. And then, you know, about uh, a month or two into the, the the time at GCP, finance came knocking on our door and said, hey, you're wildly overspending like a drunken sailor. Um, what's going on? And that was sort of the first inclination that I had uh, about how vastly important um, it was to meet the budgetary goals because we're a public corporation. We give guidance to the street. Uh, many of you on the call are in the same uh, position. and we want to share the pain that we had with you so that you can avoid this pain for yourselves in the future. Um, so um, the first bit of perspective to understand, um, in case it's not clear, is that when we move from on-premise to uh, the cloud, essentially the decision to spend money goes from a combination of finance and maybe a higher level leadership within engineering, um, who meet perhaps on a quarterly basis and decide, hey, we need to buy 20 more racks of servers. It moves from that decision-making body directly to the developer. And that is a fantastic thing. That is exactly what we want because that's how we can go fast. But quite often people don't fully understand that along with that uh, decision-making power to spend money by command line essentially um, via API, uh, there's a res corresponding responsibility that comes with it. Um, and from a finance perspective, the way they think of it is that um, they've gone from a, a process that they call CapEx, where there's a consistent and planned quarterly, yearly spend that they can forecast very effectively to monthly operating expenses or OPEX for short. And uh, to Mike's point um, earlier in the broadcast, that could be limitless. Right, um, we've gone from a situation where it's tightly controlled within a central org to where it's at the edge, and that could be a very exciting but dangerous place. So um, we know that developers love having that control, but it's it became very obvious to us at LiveRamp, at least, that we didn't talk about this shift and we didn't give developers the tools to be able to know what they're spending, um, how they're spending it. Um, we didn't give them the alerts. We didn't give them the training to understand what was going on. Uh, let's switch to the next slide here. Um, and so when Patrick and I were trying to figure this out, 
um, we spent a lot of time thinking through and talking to people and we we heard about this FinOps uh, movement and we wanted to know more. And so we flew down and took the first class that we could. It happened to be with Mike Fuller actually. And the moment that I started to hear about what it was, the moment, you know, that that is when I understood that it was a perfect framework for addressing the challenge. And really it's a combination of governance and tooling uh, and this cultural shift in engineering, um, which allows you to solve the problem. Like you, you first make the costs visible to all engineers by giving them a tool of some kind, whatever it is, that says, here's how much you're spending across your environment for your product. And then you allow them to see what opportunities there are for optimization. The engineers then make the change and then they see the information once again and it becomes this beautiful virtuous loop in running the environment. So I I think that's the context that I, I wanted to provide to all of you so that you can better understand as developers how the rest of the folks in your organization think of the challenge and think of the problem. So with that said, let me hand it off to Josh back again so that he can tell you more about how he saw this problem and tried to address the challenge as a developer. Yeah, thank you, Sasha. That was great. Yeah, yeah. so I'd like to do a little sort of like then and now comparison to, to kind of think like, how did we get here? Like what has changed and, and you know, what, how, how do we need to adapt? And um, let's, so let's kind of take a bit of a trip into the past and look at what things were like before public cloud. Uh, it's a lot like what, you know, Mike and Sasha said, um, I think from the perspective of a developer, um, yeah, like the, the most important thing I think there is that you, you never were involved in the decisions, right? There was a, such a low touch between engineering and finance because there was probably like a, uh, a VP of your division who was talking to finance for you and securing resources for you. Um, you weren't the person. Um, and also something that's really important as a developer that, that maybe isn't uh, appreciated most of the time is that, you know, some sysadmins build and operate your uh, infrastructure. And, and there's usually, you know, I don't know, I haven't worked in that many companies, but there's probably like a constrained amount of a, uh, ways to express like how you can build your stuff like for example we were limited by you know how what you could build in chef and um you know auto scaling wasn't easy um so you sort of we sort of had to build projects based on what we could imagine uh with those constraints and of course um you know anytime you wanted to change something uh next slide please um you know, if you want to change something, if you had a great idea, but your data center was just not set up for it, uh, then, you know, too bad. Like, there, you had to wait until the next capital expenditure thing. You had to make sure that you as an engineer, you have a great idea, right? You're, you uh, don't even know who to talk to to say, like, I have an idea that can revolutionize uh, our business, but we need to make a change in the data center. Now, in the cloud, right? All of that changes. In the cloud, um, you're able to take all the little building blocks that they give you, and, and they're pretty agnostic, right? Uh, they're meant to appeal to a wide variety of developers. If you have a great idea that can change your organization, then you can build it. Um, the cloud provider can take all of the little things that you don't know or care to build and operate, like database servers, networking, firewalls, and all that stuff that, that literally did require hardware in the data center. It, and, and you can move super, super, super fast, and it's so great for development. But unfortunately, um, so did the costs, right? So, you know, because now you're responsible for purchasing, purchasing decisions, if you, you know, in the process of executing your idea are not are, are not paying attention, uh, you'll probably make some interesting decisions that are great from a technical perspective, but not from a, from a financial one. And uh, believe me, if you're doing this under the auspices of a, a larger company, uh, you know, finance will notice that, that you have just spent a million bucks on something or a hundred thousand bucks or something like that. All right. And so with that, uh, time to try our great participation experiment. So if you would all join the two track FinOps channel, I'm about to post uh, a prompt and some potential answers. So, and I'll read the prompt. So how much does the app or product that you work on 
you listening to this call, like whatever team you're on, whatever company you work at, how much does that cost every month to run in the cloud, in the public cloud? And if your company isn't in the public cloud, just just give a guess to what it would cost. And I'm going to post a couple of prompts here uh, of, of potential values that I think might be fairly common. Uh, and uh, if you could leave smiley faces or emojis next to all of those options, uh, we can see which one is the most popular. And uh, if you feel that um, you have an answer that isn't accurately reflected here, feel free to just uh, throw it in. Uh, and I'll give a couple of seconds for people to, to fill in their votes. All right, there are some votes coming in. It's working, guys. It's working. Um, all right, all right. Okay, so a lot of people think they're over 200K. A lot of people think they're under 10,000. They're very happy people. <laughs> they are very. They're very happy. So, so I think there's like, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll put one more option here. I have not the slightest idea. And I'm curious to know if anyone else um, may think that way. Wow. You guys are very, uh, y'all are very cost aware. That's great. Uh, perhaps <laughs> there we go. We got we got we got. A, I don't know. Um, okay, great. So so I think what I'm trying to get at here is that um, the scale of costs um, goes up very surprisingly for individual developers. Um, it's very it was very common at LiveRamp to see projects that were spending a hundred thousand dollars a month. Um, in that order of magnitude. And, uh, you know, I think it's very hard as an individual developer just to reckon with that amount, right? Because it's probably a significant amount of your paycheck. So, you know, um, all that is to say that uh, as developers, we need to start understanding those numbers and, and, and feeling comfortable with them and to design our software with cloud costs in mind. Um, and, and so now... With that in mind, what I want to do is think about, like, uh, what do we all think about as developers when we choose to architect a brand new solution from scratch? Um, great software consists of a bunch of, like, inter you know, uh, great decisions made along uh, various, like, dimensions of choice. A choice of tooling, a choice of uh, performant algorithms, a choice of high availability, high error handling, and resilience, um, a choice of, you know... Uh, frameworks and toolkits, um, these are all the things that we usually think of as developers. But what I'd, what I'd like to propose is that cost simply becomes another dimension on that. And remember what I said about um, the trade-offs, the decisions being made on, a, on an axis, right? Like uh, you could decide that um, you're, you will throw this many compute instances at your problem. Uh, but what if you have that number of instances and only got a 70% performance or rather a 30% performance hit compared to using all, you know, the original number of instances you were thinking of, right? If you think of cost, then you'll start making that trade off and, and choose thoughtfully like where to land on that, um, on that axis, as long as you include the axis of cost in your design principles. And so let me, throw out another saucy question, right? Like, um, you know, let's say, you know, you're given, the, you know, metaphorically, the keys to the cloud, right? And you're asked, go build a car, right? Um, so you could build anything you want, right? Uh, you have this open budget to do so. And you can either build a Lamborghini, which is beautiful, and, um, you know, goes really, really fast. And it's it's something that you, you feel like you can be proud of. Or... You could build a Toyota Camry, which is cheap, uh, easy to operate, uh, low cost of repairs, um, and and could be replicated infinitely, right? Like, you know, what would you feel more proud of building? And, and you know, more on the nose, right? Like, you know, bringing the car and app analogy together, right? What's the point of a beautifully architected app in all other ways 
that simply just cost too much to run effectively. You know, should you have built built it at all if that was the caveat? So, so I think hopefully by this point I've sort of made an impression on you, the listener, that that you know um, we have to pay attention to these costs. And I think that as engineers, we can always be inclined to say, okay, this is a problem. We have to deal with it. And I'm going to do so much in-depth research to make sure that when we do execute, uh, we we build it right the very first time. And uh, in my experience, it almost never happens, right? Um, you can try your darndest to uh, foresee uh, the cloud crystal, you know, look into the cloud crystal ball and figure out, okay, these are all the things that are going to affect my performance and costs and, and prepare for them. But you're, I'm here to say that you're probably just going to be wrong the first time you do it. So um, when you're in the cloud, think about iteration and embrace embrace it, right? Like, like do some forethought about cost, but sometimes you just have to, just have to play the game to figure out uh, figure out how everything works. And, and don't be worried about making small mistakes as long as you're, you're in a tight feedback loop. Like Just like Mike said, you have the Prius or Tesla view of it and you're able to see, okay, how am I doing this week or this month? And try to make improvements and take it seriously. And I think with that, you will be um, as healthy as you could reasonably be expected to be. So don't stress out too much about it. But yeah, so sometimes you do have to learn the hard way, right? And and when you learn the hard way, it's it's really great to to, to share all the hard ways you learn so others don't hit them. So uh, here are some simplified examples of things that we did at LiveRamp that, that burned us quite a bit. Little mistakes do add up, right? So um, I don't know if any of all of you are familiar with uh, driving AWS, but um, this is a command to make a data storage bucket, right? This this looks like the most innocent thing in the world. Um, and, and how could this possibly be a, a cost concern, right? But um, if you could click next, please, yes. Uh, if you think about putting a couple of gigabytes or terabytes every week or every month into that bucket, uh, and then you uh, never remove any of the data from that bucket, uh, you start to see like a, like not only a, a, a mounting uh, incremental cost, but obviously a mounting like year-to-date cost that sort of starts rising like almost like um, in a parabola, and this is because you know you you now that you're in the cloud, you are paying for Google, Amazon, or whomever to buy hard drives for you to stick data on. Um, you have no limits, so you just are inclined as an engineer to stop thinking about it outright and just say, okay, well you know Google will handle that, and yes, they will handle it, and they will uh, gladly write the invoice for you to pay your storage bill and. Um, you know, for example, in this case, right, um, all of the major cloud providers give you a functionality to automatically expire data from a cloud bucket. And in order to keep costs um, predictable and consistent, we definitely had to make sure that we put all put those uh, lifecycle policies on all of our buckets. Um, another way we have burned ourselves in, in excruciating detail is just like, you know, um, experimentation. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, there were many cases where we told people, told teams, "Hey, go and uh, uh, experiment with with running your app on the cloud. Um, you know, use your best judgment to to try uh, to keep the experimentation limited, but you know, do what you need to do to learn." And you know, so as a, as a developer, I say, "Okay, make sure to delete this after I'm done. I'm going to create a huge uh, group of of compute instances." Um, you know, which are like m95 dot enormous and uh, with huge instance size, and then uh, oops, I got paged, like, and I had to go deal with something and um, you know solve an existing an issue with the existing production that we have, uh, you know, and then after that, after that fire was put out, which took days, you had to go back onto your secondary project and wait. You totally forgot to clear out your experimental instance, and now you've just blown through your entire R and D budget for the whole month, uh, perhaps in weeks or even days or even hours. It is it is possible to do that. So uh, just think harder about unused resources as a developer and keep an eye out for those. 
Um, and now I'd like to hand it to Patrick to help talk about what we actually did there to try and get in front of all of these emerging cost problems. Thank you, Josh. Um, so this was actually covered by Mike earlier as well. Um, the reason that these things happened to us uh, time and time again was because initially we didn't think about visibility of our costs. We didn't structure our migration to cover these ideas that these these things that we're spending money on are going to add up. And if we don't give visibility to our developers, um, how, how can we blame them for spending too much? And so what we needed to do initially, uh, once these things started to happen, was we needed to find a way to be able to give the give visibility of these costs to our teams. And, and this is where I started to really deeply partner with the, the engineering teams and where they started to, I started to realize uh, how good they were at saving saving me when things went wrong. Uh, and so I deeply appreciate all their help that they gave me. But uh, what we did was a, I just asked the teams, like, what are you using today that we might be able to quickly whip something together um, and, and be able to show everyone in a way that works for our, for our company and our teams um, how things are being overspent. And so the teams came back with a solution of just integrating um, our cost data from BigQuery, this is in GCP, running it through Datadog, uh, which has a forecasting function, and then alerting teams in Slack at set prefined uh, at, at times that we got to a certain threshold of spend. And so this was prior to this existing within GCP. This is now uh, more native functionality. You can get email alerts, but this was something that the engineering teams really put their heads together. And I think we solved this in the, in the course of like a day or two. Um, and so the amount of visibility that we went from, which was initially wh whoever had access to the billing console to every team being alerted whenever spend hit a certain level um, in a couple of days was just incredible. And so th this is an example of uh, how we solve the problem, but based on, based on the fact that we continually kept burning ourselves. And, and so we also needed at that point to, to come up with a better way to visualize all of our spend. And there were, this is, at this time, we hadn't thought about this, but we started to really get into what was available to us. Did we want to build something ourselves? Did we want to um, hire another company to do this for us? Did we want to find a platform that could manage this for us? Or did we want to use the native functionality? And we ended up landing on a combination of these things. And so we started out using a free service that Google provided, which is called Data Studio. We built some dashboards that looked very similar to this one that's on the screen. Um, but what we found out as we started to operate the environment was that we didn't have enough detail. Um, so the finance team came to our rescue and provided us some Tableau dashboards. Uh, but we found out that no one knew how to use Tableau. And so um, it was great for the financials that they needed to represent. But the engineering teams um, didn't want to spend a bunch of time in this and nobody had Tableau access. So. Um, we started partnering with the engineering teams again, saying like, okay, we need a lot more information here. We need to be able to, to have alerting uh, that goes to people outside of the Slack channel. So executives that want to see this cost. Um, we need to deeply be able to look into our GKE usage so that we can right size our, our clusters. We need it to be easy to use and a whole raft of, of, of ideas that we had. So the obvious choice was that we should build our own. Um, once we started getting into that, we realized how complicated that was, how many uh, how many people we would need for that, that we would need a dedicated PM. And then that's when we sort of started to realize that there were entire companies built around this problem that had hired an entire engineering teams and teams of PMs and sales folks. And so we ended up going, going with a cost management platform. Um, but this was sort of, uh, I don't wanna say we were uninformed, but we definitely spent more time on the technical than we did on focusing on our cost. And I believe that had we investigated our cost a lot more in the, in the beginning of our migration, we would have probably found out about some of this and we would have been a lot more prepared and given this visibility to our teams so that when things like Josh talked about were happening, they would have been limited in scope and we would have started thinking about them in more detail because we would have had alerting. We would have been able to do more to, to start optimizing our environment. And, and so I, I want to hand it back over to Josh really quickly to, to wrap up. Great. 
Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, so just to add on to the very end of that developer visibility engagement stuff, um, I think one thing we saw during our process was that um, once you gave the engineers the visibility on, on how they were doing, they actually really got into it as not as a part of their optimization problem. And they, it, hap- it that happened organically, right? Um, once they were able to monitor their, their costs, just like they were able to monitor their apps, like you know, requests, disk space, and, and whatnot, um, uh, with, with very little further prompting, there were many people on, sp- on certain teams that, that sort of got into it organically. Um, so that's, that's the second point of my conclusion here. Um, I'd like to also revisit the thesis of uh, my own section, which is that just simply to consider cost as an architectural consideration and you know, something you can be proud of to, to choose the right balance when you architect new software that's, that's destined for the public cloud. Um, and that, you know, uh, the new reality of cloud is that you'll be collaborating with finance more, uh, embrace the relationship and see it as a, as a, as a partnership, right? Like they're, they're not around to punish you. They just want to make sure that like the blast radius of any given team with their cloud spend is, you know, within some margin of error. And, and, uh, it's actually a pretty fun problem to, to do that. Um, and speaking of fun, you know, uh, remember to keep having fun, right? Because after saying all of this, you know, cautionary stuff, you know, keep having fun, right? Because cloud makes everything move faster, evolve faster. Uh, it's a great, it's a great time to be a software developer. Um, and so with that, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, let's continue the conversation on the Slack channel and, uh, hope to see you there. And thank you so much. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, I'm going to be sort of covering a few different topics here, kind of talk about our, what Pearson's gone through from our um, moving from migration to operation and how we've kind of implemented some synapse and governance to help us kind of get through that with all of our projects. So just to start out and introduce myself, uh, my name is Ashley Macko. I've been with Pearson about six years in the assessment testing industry for 10 years. I started as a technical project manager and now I'm leading the charge to manage a new global FinOps team at Pearson. Um, for those that don't know who Pearson is, we've been traditionally known as kind of a textbook company, but we're so much more than that. Um, we're leading the industry in online assessments, including certification and online curriculum. I think going back to what Mike was talking about, you guys can imagine how COVID has impacted us in both of those sectors in the last couple months. Um, kind of going through our story, so we had rapid growth in four years. We um, doubled down our engineering team. We went from six AWS accounts to over 125 accounts, getting into the GCP space and the Azure space. We migrated um, over 106 applications. We were doing lift and shifts, tech upgrades, and even building brand new applications straight in the cloud. We decommissioned four data centers, and then we were all of a sudden spending three times the amount on AWS. So very, very quick growth in a short period. And then about six months ago, um, we actually faced another challenge where um, we merged our entire cloud management under a centralized team. So instead of having different siloed IT groups, it became one cloud management organization. And then we were dealing with difficult challenges of managing two master payers. Um, we had many applications, different business owners, more engineering teams, you know, regionally based in different areas with different levels of cloud maturity. Um, our cloud financial scope now again grew almost three times more than where we were even six months ago. And we've been challenged to close about 12 data centers by 2024. So rapid growth, decentralizing, or, or centralizing our silo IT group. So that left us with quite a few issues. Um, one, we really couldn't get a handle of how much staff we had because there's so much rapid growth. We ha- found it really hard to ba- break down the bill uh, with products that shared accounts. We didn't really know how to prioritize one request from another. Like, what was revenue generating? What was more important that we worked on next? We could predict cost spend um, even six months out, and this included predicting what it would cost to do data migration centers. Um, we built something in AWS only to find out it actually didn't have any funding behind mm-hmm. it. And many of our stakeholders would experience this like sticker shock at the end of the month where all of a sudden they were being charged for their cloud usage and they were used to the CIO or paying for their entire bill. They weren't used to that. 
And then overall, we're just lacking really a cloud conscious culture. We're just kind of spending money with not thinking about what that impact would be to the business. Mm -hmm. Why do we need to handle this and we implement this three things? We form a formal synapse global service team. Um, we create a gated onboarding process for all new Hey, uh, Ashley, um, we're having a really hard time hearing you. I don't know if you can hear us. Sorry, everybody, a little technical difficulty here. Doesn't look like she can hear us, so I'll drop back off. Can you guys not hear me? Yeah, it's really muffled and garbled. I don't know if you can get closer to the phone or uh, something. It's It's really difficult to hear. Is this any better? Oh, yes. So much better. You want me to back up a few slides? You go back one, it got really bad there toward the end, yeah. All right, can I see if this is better? That's, yeah, it's better. Thank you. Yep. All right, I'll just kind of back up a little bit here. Um, so we had a lot of massive growth at one time, and then we also had um, moved to central siloed IT groups. We were centralizing that now. We led to a lot of issues dealing with staffing, prioritization, not able to predict our spend anymore. Um, our stakeholders were seeing all the sticker stock. They were used to not Muted. paying for anything, and now they're paying for all of their stuff. And then just in general, we just weren't very cloud cautious, cost conscious culture at all. So that led us to take some actions. Um, what we did is we formed a FinOps team, a global team. We created a gated onboarding process for all new cloud applications, and we created an inclusive cloud governance board that would have to review and pass all policies. So a common question I get asked is, what does your FinOps team look like? So we have um, a group of nine people. Um, we have what we call a FinOps practitioner. They're very focused on our education side. They're billing specialists, doing our RI management, savings plan, marketplaces, billing management. We also have data analysts. So they're looking at our cloud trends, looking at what we forecasted versus actuals, focusing on anomaly detection. And then they're also writing business uh, optimization cases to present to the SRE or development teams. We also have two automation engineers focusing on internal op uh, automation. So how do we make our FinOps processes better and scalable? And then we have opt in cost management automation. So these are services that we're going to provide out to everybody to use. So maybe they want to clean up their sandbox every three weeks. So we help build some of that automation that they can leverage. We also have a BI developer um, that focuses on a lot of our Tableau reporting. So that's internal KPIs that we want to track, that scorecard. Um, where we're measuring you know, those KPIs, but at an application level, and then a lot of our executive reporting that we do. Another question I get is like, where does our FinOps team? So we are embedded in our cloud and hosting organization, which is under the CIO, um, but we work directly with Pearson Finance Services as well. I'm gonna do a mic check. Is everyone still hearing me okay? Yes, sounding a lot better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, one minute, sure. All right, so going into our gated process that we developed. So we realized that, again, we can't just give everybody and everybody an AWS account, nor do we want them just putting them on their corporate credit card. So we really wanted to create this gated process. And I will say, at first, I think a lot of our engineers were a little bit hesitant. I think anytime you use the word process and gate, there's a little bit of fear, right? Um, so we really engaged them and said, you know, how do we make your guys' life easier? And, you know, we learned things like scope creep was a big thing. Um, being told to build something and there wasn't money was a big thing. Uh, being asked to build something in two weeks when they've already got four other projects in mind wasn't working for them. So we worked a lot with the engineering teams to build this out. And this is what it looks like. We do an engagement phase. We define what we're going to build. We get everybody to commit to building it on that timeline. Then they build it and we launch it and go operational and we provide operational support. So just to give you a sense of what that looks like, so we have all product owners fill out a form. Um, this is how they want to engage our team. 
they get assigned a technical project manager with them. We collect information like what's the project, description, security requirements, any timelines that it's due on. Then we do an engagement period. So if you can imagine, this is um, a group of people now virtually sitting together. We have engineering lead, security lead, governance lead, FinOps lead. We sit down and we talk about the project and we say, what is the objective? We figure out what this thing is going to cost. What is going to be the schedule? When do things need to be built and signed off by? What are going to be some of our constraints? Um, and we document that all in a statement of work. Then we kind of come back and do an internal review. So our hosting team kind of decides, like, is this something we even think should move to the cloud? Um, I think longer term, you know, we're, we're still heavily AWS, but we'll probably focus which cloud provider is the best fit for this thing to move. Um, we'll also kind of push back saying, you know, we don't want to move this until it's been out of Oracle, or we don't want to move this until they've refactored the database. So we, we do have a little wiggle room to say no at this point. During this internal review meeting, we also create a solutions diagram. Um, we'll put in there things like we recommend serverless. We recommend that your lower environments run on spot. We document assumptions and risks. This is really useful to kind of help protect the engineers that are going to work on this. And then our FinOps team uses this diagram to actually calculate what the infrastructure and labor cost is going to be. After we have this meeting, we get back together um, and we, we all decide to commit to this thing. Uh, and then security also presents any things that they have risk or aversion. If the product owner still decides to go forward with it, at least that's documented. FinOps presents the cost saving opportunities and labor and usually we give them several options and they're able to choose from the one they want to do. The goal of this meeting, um, or within a few days, is that we've committed to timelines, we've committed to resources. So that's been another benefit for our engineers is because we've actually been able to go out and hire more resources for the projects that are slotted six months, nine months, a year from now, because we know they're coming and we know we need those resources to do that project. We've committed to responsibility. So if a product owner is coming in, we let them know that they own security, they own costs, they own tagging compliance. Um, and that we let them know what we're going to help provide for them, guard duty, config rules. Uh, and then both teams are aware of what the estimate is, and they've both talked about it, and they've both committed to that's the target that they're going to stay on. Uh, once that is done and everybody has agreed to it, we move into providing them access. And so we typically give, uh, right now we're giving about three different accounts for a product, so they get disaster recovery, non-production, and prod. We also provide that uh, development team a sandbox account. So going back to what Josh was saying either, earlier, we don't want to like not let these engineers be able to build and be creative. And so they do have a sandbox to do those activities, but it has a limit of $500 that can be spent in it. So they're going to need to shut things down on the weekend. They can't leave their, um, their sandbox running all the time, right? So we do want to still inspire that creativity, but kind of set a dollar limit to it as well. And then our FinOps team, once those accounts are created, we automatically create budget alerts uh, for those accounts that alert out to the engineering team that's building it and to the product owner that owns it. Um, and then all of our accounts get linked under our payers, so they're all getting our, you know, our EDP uh, discount applied. Um, they're getting all of our config rules set with it. And we just, as a company, have more insights to what we're spending. Um, this is just an example of the budget alert. This is very native of AWS that you can do. Um, as you can imagine, we now have over 500 accounts, so we've had to develop some process to kind of automate creating these budget alerts. And then we allow teams to reforecast every quarter. And so we've had to figure out a method to go in and change these budget alerts every quarter if they've changed their threshold and they've gotten sign off. So um, kind of goes back to what I was saying about our FinOps team having some automation built into it. All right, um, so during the pre-operational stage, what our FinOps team is doing is we reach out and we do a one-hour meeting with the team, and this includes us explaining to them um, how to contact us, how to use our services. Um, we'll do some training on how to use the cloud native financial management tools. We'll go over workflows of how to make RI purchases, how to forecast, how end-to-end -end chargeback is gonna work for their accounts. So there's just no surprises before they get started. We also host something called FinOps Friday Learning Sessions. These are typically one-hour sessions where we pick a specific topic. So maybe we're going to talk about the different uh, tier storage of S3. And this is either hosted by FinOps or by a cloud vendor. So what we do in these sessions is we kind of train the engineers on how to use that service uh, most cost-effectively. We also do bi-weekly training on cloudability. Um, we do Q&A sessions on this. Um, we also go ahead and configure budget alerts, like I mentioned, and any monitoring alerts to them. 
if any of our budget alerts go over a certain dollar amount or go over a certain um, number of times, like three months in a row, then we will get together with that team and we'll do kind of a cost cadence with them to get them back on track as well. So that's all the, the added service that our FinOps team use, uh, does to kind of help both the engineering and the product team. While these engineers are building out, uh, we kind of give them the space, right? We want them to be able to build their infrastructure within the timelines that they were given to do that. Um, we're there to help advise, to un help understand costs as they may need it. Um, you know, maybe somebody says, actually, we decided to switch from this RDS instance to serverless Aurora. Can you tell us how that changes the forecast, right? Um, they Sometimes people will be like, we decided that we're going to run a data migration services for 14 days. You know, what's that going to cost? That's usually something that we get a budget alert for, and then we can tell them, hey, did you know you did this? Um, perf environments are a big one, right? So during that build-out phase, it's very much letting them, you know, do what they need to do, but we're still here to advise or let them know about any anomalies that may happen. Finally, when we go post-operational, so FinOps still stays connected to the product. Um, we provide monthly costing reports to show actuals versus what was forecasted. We track any accounts that are going over budget. We track why they went over budget, so that's there. Um, we often are kind of that buffer to help defend from finance, right? We can kind of explain to them what's going on. Uh, we also track any auditing of compliance, and that's mostly because a lot of our tagging relates to how do we do chargeback as well. We do quarterly forecasts, so we go ahead and forecast all, you know, we have over a thousand products, we forecast them all. We go check in with the managers and see if anything's gonna change that's make it significantly different from this forecast, and we get them to agree to the forecast, and then we help submit that on behalf of them to finance. Um, we make um, all RI and savings plans purchases, and then we also have FinOps analysts assigned to each business tower. So a business tower for us is anybody that's spending more than 500K per month in cloud spend, we um, provide them cost optimization business cases. And that's what I kind of want to show you next. So here's an example of a business case that we provide. So um, the analyst is gathering all of this information from various tools. Um, we're meeting with engineering and product teams and sitting down and looking at the recommendations. We're allowing them to have the opportunity to decline a recommendation or opt in a recommendation. If they opt into it, we typically ask like, when are you going to be able to do this? Like, let's get it on your backlog story. And then we'll follow up with them on agreed upon timeline. So we're not there, you know, to pester them about resizing every little thing, but we try to put enough of a case together to say, here are 12 things that you can do in this account to, you know, reduce costs. You know, go ahead and look at it and let us know what you think you can take action on and what you can't. Um, and then we'll come back and, and, and kind of show you the difference and help you write a success story on doing that. So here's a good example. Um, this team, we recommended that they move to spot. You know, they've had negative experience on this. This is one that I like to then call up our AWS fans and say, hey, can you have a one-on-one -on -one with this team about Spot? You know, I want to see what's going on there, that they had negative experiences with it. Um, the other one is trying to get them to reduce costs on the weekend. Uh, so they accepted and completed it. And you can see here that this is them scaling down the weekend. Now, we'll probably come back and say, you know, we probably could go a little bit more, right? We tried that. We were able to scale down to meet, we scale it even more down. So this is just a good example of like how we use our business cases. But it's, at the end of the day, it's up to the engineering teams, the product teams um, to accept or reject those recommendations because they're ultimately doing the work and supporting the work. And then lastly, I mentioned governance. So we've developed a governance board. Um, it's been about a year now. Uh, so it is, we host biweekly calls. Anybody in the company can bring issues that they believe requires further discussion. Um, the outcome is usually a rejected policy or we create a formal policy or maybe there's some technical implementation that has to be done. There are 12 voting members um, on it and that range from our FinOps team, our SRE leads, CISO, QA teams. Um, so just a couple examples of what our governance board might have come to it. So FinOps brought to the governance board, you know, we don't want you to repurpose AWS accounts. Um, it's very confusing on a financial end when you shut an account down and then you spin it open and then all of a sudden there's these costs associated with it. So that was something that we brought forward um, and they ran it as a, they executed it as a formal policy that they don't do that anymore. Um, another one is uh, a little bit more technical. So we felt that elastic IPs that were unattached greater than X days should be terminated. This was interesting. We all, we got together the SRE teams. Um, we actually went and said 14 days. The SRE teams were like, no, it should be five days. And so um, we were able to get this implemented as a policy um, with actually a shorter duration. And then 
um, go ahead and now build out the technical invitation, which means we're putting out a cloud custodian policy to do this. Um, so I, I feel like as you know, as you mature as an organization, having this type of governance that's very inclusive is really important. And that kind of goes into my conclusion piece, which is, you know, if, either if you're a large corporation or a small corporation, I think having some processes and procedures to get started into the cloud is very healthy. It allows you to educate people. It allows people to have a gate to go through. It allows people to have other people to consult with that they may not have. Um, I think also trying to utilize your FinOps team. They can help do the data gathering. They can do analysis of costs. They can help drive conversations. I think the same way as an engineer, you set up pager duty alerts so you can, you know, go to a movie on Saturday and not think about, you know, if your application is going to alert. You know, our FinOps team is here to make sure if anomaly detection goes off, you've got us to help do the research for you as well. And then I, I also think another key um, to kind of a more mature cloud estate is to make sure you have a collective governance that, um, you know, it, it has people from all over the organization part of it and be open to that. I think at that, I'm going to pass it back over to you, JR, for some Q&A. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. That was really good content. Appreciate you going back and covering some of those bits. Um, Particularly like the, the the process you put in place uh, for a lot of this is I think, you know, many are, are thinking about this culturally, but haven't gotten to that level yet. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so we have a, about 15 minutes left and we've got a, a number of questions uh, that want to go through in a panel discussion format here. And so the first one, um, and if we can bring everybody uh, up, it'd be great. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to go to Mike Fuller at Atlassian. Um, and, you know, Atlassian is obviously kind of at the center of a lot of engineers processes, right, with JIRA and those types of, of products. And, and one of the questions that comes up a lot is, you know, how to actually work this type of FinOps work into sprints, right? How, how to get it set up so that people are actually either planning for it or they're using, you know, backlog and grabbing pieces out. How have you seen the in your own company? How have you gotten, you know, engineering teams to make this a regular part of the workflow and, and gotten that? just sort of flowing in an iterative fashion. Yeah, so for us, it was um, the key was having management buy-in to the, to the need for FinOps and, and showing that it's important to teams to have cost focus as in, in amongst all of the other things that they've got, you know, to balance off. Um, and so we, we kind of have teams that are usually trying to find sort of balanced sprints where they, they're introducing a certain number of points. Um, you know, some of those points will be security related tickets. Some of those will be uh, cost related tickets. And so having that sort of uh, uh, focus of a few points in, in sprints. The, the other one will be uh, coming back to sort of the content I was talking about with um, metric driven. Um, we're looking for teams that have got sort of op the biggest opportunities with the lowest effort, um, you know, to to reduce spend on on wastage and so we can identify those teams uh and get conversation happening with them we can we can ask them to to, to roadmap it into a you know a near-term future sprint um and they'll get those extra few points where they might spend you know a few hours um during the sprint to focus on on cleaning up some of that wastage and then it's really key for us then to show the impact that that has had so that, so that they feel like it's worth putting that time in their sprints Excellent. Anyone else want to join in on that one? Oh, Sasha, Sasha looks like you're muted. There we go. Okay, uh, I, I would just uh, Mike provided a pretty full answer. The the the, the thing I would add at a ten thousand foot view is to uh, to present and frame the the FinOps work and the cost optimization work as simply an extension of a developer's thinking and workload about their product, right? That cost is simply another dimension of an application's efficiency. And if you can do that, then everyone can begin to slot in how to frame it, how to include it in the regular work, how to include it in the JIRAs. It just becomes an extension of this, um, you know, bolted on idea of DevOps and then the bolted on idea of FinOps as well. Yeah, that extension of the work, I think, is spot on. I, I hear it described as like getting them to be good citizens, right? And part of that being a good engineering citizen is, is to start to think of this as a dimension, you know, of the work that they're doing. Um, so, you know, on that topic, I mean, FinOps isn't really something that a single person does, right? It's it's really a cultural change where you want to get engineers thinking about it alongside their uptime and app decks and all these, all these areas. 
you know, for the LiveRamp folks, you know, who I think you started your practice probably in the last year, you know, what were the first initial things that you were, that you saw uh, were most effective at, at starting to get that culture to be, to be picked up and adopted? Like, how did you, how did you bootstrap it in your organization? Yeah, so so maybe I can start to tackle that question, and then Josh and uh, Patrick can jump in. So our very first step was just figuring out that we needed it and that it existed, and you know we, you know we had little pieces of this understanding, but it was really when we attended the session with Mike and we heard about FinOps that we thought this is definitely something we need to do. And then I came back from that session. Uh, put together a presentation for the execs and had them sign off on it. And of course, that started off with getting the engineering VP bought in as well. And then once we had that, it was a matter of working, you know, with Josh and with Patrick to figure out how we should approach the the engineers themselves and how and how best to to talk about it. So so on that note, let me let me pass the baton to to Patrick to talk about like from his perspective, what worked? Sure, yeah. So I was more focused on the product side as well um, because the, I, I just heard someone mention, uh, Mike was talking about road mapping. Um, this became a really hot topic for us because when you present to someone, uh, to an entire team of product managers that the roadmap they've been waiting 12 months to build because you used their engineering resources to migrate, now need to be diverted again to save cost. Um, it, it was not well received, uh, and so there was a there was a lot of conversations that, that needed to happen around why this was valuable and how, in the end, it would actually be helpful to them uh, as a product manager and, and give them advantages in how their app functioned um, and how they wouldn't have to worry or how they could get to a point where it was more cost efficient. They liked that tack. Um, and, and in terms of working with the engineers, uh, I think I would let Josh speak to that about how that became uh, more useful to him. Yeah. Um, so one thing that, that kind of jumped into my mind while hearing you all talk about this was um, a similar concept that's used, you know, uh, in, in uh, DevOps, which is like blameless postmortems, which is to say that like, you know, uh, when you when something goes wrong, um, you try to find the best solution to the problem, like collaboratively with all of your stakeholders, and describe exactly what happened and how we can try to prevent it from happening again. Um, I think that blameless attitude should also shift towards um, like like when you implement FinOps, you can do the same thing, right? Like when bad things happen, like try not to make it feel like it's the person's fault, um, and and try to include them in the solution. Uh, I think. That's the attitude with which, you know, we, we took some hits at LiveRamp um, with, with cost, and, and we realized that there, we couldn't just, like, shake it down. We would have to um, have the cooperation of the developers who knew about their applications and how they ran in order to get the best solution and compromise with, um, you know, all the different knobs we could turn to improve cost. So... And then beyond that, right, like, as I said before in my, in my segment, like, uh, once people could see the, the data and sort of the problem statement and the statement of, like, here's what doing the right thing looks like, um, can you help us get there? Uh, everyone in our team was really, and our engineering team was really happy to move, it, move the, the ball forward towards that, that right thing. Excellent. Uh, I was gonna I was gonna pass one to um, Ashley, but she's having this audio issue, so sorry to sorry to leave it out of the conversation, Ashley. Um, but I'll I'll pass this one, uh, you know, to whoever wants to wants to pick it up, which is, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the aspect of you know the engineering team specifically, uh, but it a big part of this right is is getting those teams working with the other teams, and uh, I've had so many conversations with finance folks who are needing to wrap their head around. Uh, cloud concepts and reporting. So what things did you do in your organization to bridge the gap into their reporting processes? And what what were the sort of initial and maybe early wins or, or challenges you ran into? Interfacing engineering with finance, if you will. Um, let, me, let me take that first and just provide a slightly saucy take on it, which is that um, 
when we were trying to align everyone together, we put a lot of thought into where the FinOps practice should sit. Should it be in finance or should it be engineering? And because we thought that part of what was required to solve this problem was perspective and context and being as close to the problem as possible. And so we ended up putting it in engineering. Now, um, having spoken to lots of other folks in the FinOps Foundation and other companies, we have learned that people take different approaches on this one. And, you know, I, I can see where putting it in finance, if finance is the central decision maker and they're quite interested and they have an idea of what they want their reports to look like, makes perfect sense. Um, in the large consumer internet companies that, that we've talked to, it's usually part of engineering, but I'm um, I'm actually quite curious what what everyone's experience has been, and like, um, if if anyone is a strong advocate of one approach or the other. I'm hoping it's you get a so I can jump in on this one. Yeah, we yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> yeah. So with our finance org, we had to kind of do a FinOps finance summit. To be honest, um, we had to kind of level set mm -hmm. terminology. Like, I didn't understand a general ledger any more or less than they understood an RI purchase, mm -hmm. right? So we kind of um, came up with an agenda together of what are things that we feel like they should know and things that they think we should know. And we really had to get terminology right. Like we would constantly, one common thing is say, this is how much you spent in January. And then later learn that actually, because they do a cruel methodology, that one show up till February. And so we were talking about numbers in different terms and different periods, right? So. Um, terminology was number one to kind of get on the same page with the finance team. We still are probably like a middle person between our finance and engineers. Um, they somewhat appreciate that, right? They'll come through the FinOps team and then we'll work with the finance team. I hope over time we can kind of close that gap. Um, but I'd actually say some of the teams that we realized needed to work together more than anybody was our own engineering teams. We were so mm. siloed that we had people that were really good at spot over here and really good at using Fargate. And, they were just sitting here experts in the area, but they weren't cross talking to each other. And so that's another area we got to come in and say, you want to do spot and you're confused. I know this team that's a hundred percent spot. Like let's have you guys meet. And we just got out of the way and let them talk. So I think that's powerful in itself too. I always wonder about that. I, I've, I've met these, uh, I'll almost call them unicorn engineers over the years. They're like really get into the cost stuff, right? I, Josh, I hear you talking about it and, and Mike and I, like you, you, you get it. But that, that seems to be the exception, right? So like, I'm wondering, is, is that a personality thing or, or were you, you know, exposed to some of the others are? And, and, and if, if we were to figure out what is that magic bullet? Cause that's, I think that's what everybody's trying to get to. Like I got 500 engineers, like what is the motivational piece? And we can say visibility, we can say, you know, given the metrics, but can you get everybody into it? Do you need a certain type of more business minded engineer? What's, what's the right profile? What do you think, Mike? Or does everybody uh, even need to you get away yeah. with that? So. Yeah, I think that was probably my, my point is maybe maybe you just need. So we, we talk about like the idea of uh, at Atlassian of like security champions where we try and get people around the org within the teams to be sort of champion security amongst them. Um, and so we're trying to actually adopt that model within Atlassian where we get these FinOps champions that are, you know, one or two people, you know, in amongst teams all around the whole organization that are on the lookout for for those um, you know you know things that are causing pain for for spend and they're aware of their budgets and they're they're able to sort of um, help their colleagues keep in line and, and I, even on my uh, team at Atlassian you know we're sort of six engineers and there's only a couple of us that actually get into the FinOps stuff you know the other ones would, would rather you know jump off a cliff than to, to, to do FinOps. And so it's, it's kind of like balancing that out and finding the right people within the org. And I, I think trying to train you know, thousands of people on FinOps might be impossible, but training individuals spread out through the org is probably much more achievable. Excellent. Yeah, and if I, could, if I could add on to that, like um, I think that mm -hmm. for some engineers, you know, our experience at LiveMap is that people had a fixed idea of what they felt they had signed up to do. And uh, finance was not one of those. My job. And actually, exactly, exactly, right? Like, and, you know, I, I empathize with that feeling, right? Especially as an engineer, you know, you, you t it, for better or for worse, many engineers tend to see the world in, in various blacks and whites. It's like, okay, I'm here to be an ML engineer. And if I have to do anything besides ML, it's a waste of my time. Um, 
you know, I, I don't think that attitude can be resolved overnight. Um, but it is something I empathize with. And I, and I think that just, you know, hitting a steady drumbeat of stating it as part of your optimization problem, um, which, of course, optimization tends to be part of every engineer's job at some level. Um, that's, that's the sort of wedge you can just try to keep making bigger and bigger to try to get people interested in, in checking, you know, taking care of that uh, mindfulness when, when building their new apps. I, I think that's spot on. It's, it's that wedge. It's not a one-time process, and it's not going to be the other quickly. you got to start slowly, iteratively over time. Uh, and really scale it up. Um, when with that, we are we are out of time. Um, I did wanted to say, you know, if, if anybody wants to continue this conversation, uh, FinOps Foundation is there with a bunch of folks like the ones on this call in Slack channels and meetings. Uh, you can check it out, finops.org. Not finos, but finops.org uh, for ambiguity's sake. Um, so thank you all. Uh, content was phenomenal. Appreciate all the presenters taking the time to work through this. It was a fun experience. Hope we get to all have beers together at some point. And everybody have a great, great weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you all for attending. And thanks everyone on the call. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.